Hello, this is Chuck Stull looking at the internet. I'd like to start with a, with a fairly simple question. What is the internet? Now this is a question that has several answers, um, and perhaps the first is not the most obvious to everyone. I would argue that the internet is not so much a thing as it is a set of standards. But the internet is designed so that different computer systems can recognize and send information to users who request it. So packets of information can be sent through different routes automatically and then reassembled. Uh, so it's sometimes talked about packet uh, distribution. Specifically, the internet is a communications protocol or a series of communications protocols. So we have TCP IP, Transmission Control Protocol, Internet Protocol, is a language to connect that network of computers. And it has specifications on the format, the address, the transmission, and the routing of so data so that it can be moved from place to place. Now, there are many other standards for specific tax, tasks. Uh, SMTP is an email protocol. HTTP, perhaps the one you're most familiar with, Hypertext Transfer Protocol, uh, is standards to exchange uh, and transfer information for web pages. Now, these standards are set by committees, internet standards bodies. Um, there are many of these, but the Internet Engineering Task Force or the World Wide Web Consortium would be examples. Now, of course, the Internet also uses many physical things as well. Um, these are um, varied. They include the local computer networks, telephone networks, um, both wired fiber optic and cell networks, uh, the cable networks, uh, routers, network exchange or network access points. And these are all owned by different groups by universities, by telephone companies, by cable companies, by other private businesses. Typically, users pay for a connection uh, to an ISP, an internet service provider, and the internet service provider pays to connect to the backbone to connect um, both cross-country and uh, internationally. The backbones often have peering where they allow free interconnection with other backbones or other of those major long-distance um, fiber optic cables. Now, of course, the third component of the internet is the content that it distributes. And often that's what we think of as the internet. Uh, all of the web pages, the social media, the streaming services. These, of course, are created by individuals, by companies, by nonprofit organizations, and uh, in some cases by government agencies. The information is um, stored on servers, either locally, you could even have a server in your, in your basement, um, or in the cloud. Now the cloud, of course, is not really a cloud. It is still a physical data center, and often these are operated by um, big players uh, like Amazon Web Services, Microsoft, Google, IBM, or Oracle, um, who have these networks of servers in uh, data centers or server farms uh, storing information and sharing it as requested. Let me turn next to the development of the Internet. The Internet began with the United States Department of Defense in the 1960s with their Advanced Research Projects Administration, or ARPA, and it was known as ARPANET. And ARPANET was designed specifically to link universities um, and high-tech defense contractors along with the military. By the 80s, uh, the National Science Foundation had taken over um, most of this network, and it became known as the NSFNet. Um, so uh, it was designed to connect supercomputer centers uh, located at uh, large universities. Uh, this developed the high-speed backbone, and it had much, much bigger use. Um, the NSF did include the private sector in here, um, so some of the uh, telephone companies, um, the universities, and computer companies like IBM. Now, the internet at this stage was really different than what we know today. Um, 
right? It was used for email, it was used for uh, file transfers, uh, for Gopher, but almost all of that was text. The internet really changed to uh, its familiar shape um, with the development of, um, of the web protocols by Tim Berners-Lee, um, working in, um, in Europe at a uh, major research um, institute there. Um, and around 1990, he developed the protocol for the web, right? HTML, hypertext markup language, and then HTTP, the hypertext transfer protocol. The, the next step that really made it practical um, was a student, Mark Anderson, um, at the University of Illinois working at the, uh, um, in their computers uh, section uh, with supercomputer funding, who developed the, the first browser um, for the web, which was a mosaic that was uh, like 1992 that then went on to become um, Netscape, and Anderson um, ran that as a private business, um, and it eventually became uh, Firefox, which is open source that some of you may still know as a, as a web browser. The idea of the web is that the standards were open and accessible and freely usable. Now, the transition to the web that we know it today really happened in the um, late 1990s when um, the private network, when the network uh, transitioned to private ownership and particularly when it opened in the late 90s to commercial users. Once opened for commercial use, there was an explosion of internet companies in the late 90s. So Amazon uh, founded in 1994, Google founded in 1998, uh, or Pets.com also founded in 1998. Now Pets.com is an interesting case. It collected millions of dollars in venture capital. Uh, it famously spent uh, over a million dollars on a Super Bowl ad in January 2000. It went public in uh, February of 2000, raising over $80 million, but it was selling um, pet food at below cost, uh, so it was always operating at a loss, and as it grew quickly, as many internet companies did, it just lost lower, low, more and more money. By the end of the year 2000, um, the company had to go into liquidation. And Pets.com was not alone. There was a huge overinvestment in the late 1990s in internet companies and in fiber optic networks. Um, the stock values of those kinds of companies had seen an incredibly rapid increase in the end of the, um, of the century, but eventually it was seen that those prices were unsustainable. The stock prices dropped dramatically, losing about 80% of their value over the next couple of years. Uh, many firms failed. Uh, Capital became much harder to raise, um, and some of that fiber optic network went dark, meaning it was still um, in place, but was no longer active. But on the consumer side, internet growth continued, um, and companies with solid businesses grew as well. Technological change also made new services possible um, and attracted more customers. So in the early days, consumers would have to use a, a modem, dial up uh, a telephone, and connect at a very low rate. And that made it take a long time to uh, download a photo. And a movie was, um, you know, could take hours to, to download. Um, broadband has made that much quicker, and that allowed increased connection speeds, which allowed things like streaming video services to develop. Now, a little bit later, the smartphones allowed development of mobile apps, um, and if we had fiber directly to the home, we might have um, even more bandwidth, allowing for um, potentially all kinds of interactive services, but since we don't have that um, wired, um, we currently don't know what that would look like. As the bandwidth grew and as technology changed, we did see... Um, some really important new sectors of internet growth. 
So social media depends on a large number of users, users who can both download and upload to the internet. Um, and the early um, social networks came in the early 2000s, so Friendster and MySpace, LinkedIn all in 2003. Uh, Facebook um, was founded in 2004, initially only available at Harvard University. Uh, it then spread to uh, or opened to other Ivy League universities. And the next wave uh, was to selected other universities and colleges throughout the country. K College was in that wave. Eventually, um, all uh, college um, and universities, all the .edu uh, emails were eligible. By 2005, it went to high schools, uh, and then 2006, it was open to everyone. Um, other social media developed shortly after that, Reddit in 2005, YouTube 2006, bought by Google the next year, Twitter also founded in 2006. Now, the mobile apps required um, to have a large number of people, not just with cell phones, but with smartphones, and that really started to hit a um, an important level at the end of the uh, 2000s. Uh, so Uber started in 2009, WhatsApp 2009, bought by Facebook uh, in 2014. Instagram founded in 2010, Facebook bought it two years later. Snapchat 2011, Lyft in 2012. Um, so we started to see all kinds of new services develop as technology changed and as consumers um, the consumer numbers grew. Now, many of these firms chose to locate in Northern California in the San Francisco Bay Area, now famously known as Silicon Valley. There had been earlier predictions that the internet would flatten geography, but that is not what happened. Instead, we've seen a growth of high-tech centers in very specific geographic places. Silicon Valley is the most famous and largest of these, but we do have other um, tech centers in the United States, in Seattle, in New York. We have them in other countries like Bangalore, India. These are examples of agglomeration or spatial clustering, where we see a particular industry concentrate in a specific geographic area. Now, some of this has taken place for, for many years. Um, due to transportation costs, but that's not really relevant for internet companies. So to find out more, you should read my chapter posted on Moodle about Silicon Valley. This has been Chuck Stoll talking about the internet from Kalamazoo College. Thank you for listening.